I've asked hundreds of women, what do you look for in a man? And they'll say things like, oh, I'm looking for a kind man, a family-focused man, a generous man. Not once did I hear a woman say, I want a man that I'm attracted to. Oh, I don't get it. I I'm a kind, generous man. How come I'm having so much trouble entering into relationships and maintaining them? If my wife has the opportunity to leave me for a man who has 10 more dollars in his pocket, she will immediately do it without conscience, without reservation. With eight or nine billion people on the planet, you might might encounter a better possible partner for you, but the costs associated with securing that increase in value may be offset by the expenses incurred by leaving one relationship for the other, so it's actually a net loss. Everyone is unique and everyone is replaceable. Fantastic, guys. Thank you very much. What do I do now? Do I go to the gym? Do I read books? Do I practice my virtues? Save up for a red Ferrari? Like, what is the right thing to do here? Is marriage falling apart? And will there even be marriage in the future? This is a question that a lot of people are asking today, especially as fewer and fewer Gen Z people are bothering to get married. Divorce is going down, but rates of marriage are also plunging. Today, we brought on Dr. Orion Terabin so that he can talk to us about what he sees as the difference between high-value men and low-value men and why they're having a hard time dating. He also talks to us about the high-value woman and the low-value woman and what she can expect in the dating market. And finally, we talk about marriage. Is it even going to matter in the future? This is a great conversation. I know a lot of you have said in the comments, he is the number one creator you want to see me collaborate with. So we brought him on today to have these discussions. Let's go. Orion, the number one thing I want us to jump into right off the bat is something everybody at home has been talking to me about. They've asked me to speak to you about personally because it's something you and I align on. And it's a very, very hot topic that makes a lot of people angry when we talk about it transactional relationships. Now, you and I both, I believe, agree on this. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong, that relationships are transactional by nature. All relationships are transactional by nature. This is something I've caught a lot of flack for saying over the years. I think you have as well. I've seen many of your clips talking about this. I would love to hear your take on relationships and transactions within them. Can you please roll us in that way? Certainly. So the little asterisk that I'll put next to that is that I believe that all consensual relationships are transactional. So, for example, one of the biggest exceptions to that rule are the relationships between parents and their young children. That's not a consensual relationship. As far as we know, those children didn't ask to be born and certainly didn't ask to be born to that unique set of parents. That said, once that child grows up and becomes an adult, they do have the ability to choose how and to what extent they're going to relate to their adult parents, and it becomes increasingly transactional as the person ages. But there are examples of, let's say, non-transactional relationships that we all participate in at some point in our lives, but the vast majority of consensual voluntary relationships, I believe, are transactional. So one thing that I define a relationship as the media, as the medium in which value is transacted. So that is a necessary and sufficient condition for a relationship to exist. Where value is transacted, a relationship happens. Where no value is transacted, there is no relationship, nor is there a relationship possible. It's just, it's just not possible to have a relationship where nothing passes between the two people. Okay? So the, the issue that I have, that I come up against with respect to the transactionality of relationships is that people... <sighs> They really believe that it diminishes the quality of the relationship. No one likes to think about their relationships that transactionally. And so what we encounter is that there are rules around how explicit and overt you can be about the transactionality of relationships. For example, in voluntary professional relationships, we have a culture where we expect everything to be defined and explicitly negotiated beforehand. But if someone were to approach their friendships or their romantic relationships in that way, you would think that they were from another planet. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those relationships aren't transactional. We just have to engage in the negotiation process with greater tact, indirectness, and subtlety. I agree with this. Uh, in particular, 
because all transactions that exist within relationships are an exchange of value of some sort, even if that's a feeling, even if that's a connection, that's safety, it's love, it's, I don't want to say sex, but there's there's ways we could transact sex in numerous ways, ethical perhaps and, and otherwise. But one big thing that makes a lot of people angry that I hear quite, a, quite often from the female members of our audience is that their relationship feels too transactional. This is where they begin shutting down. This is where they get upset at their husband. Everything is so transactional. It feels horrible to them. Can you talk a little bit about this feature? Because I know that those women are out in our audience right now expressing that. You could say that one of the rules of romantic relationships is that at core, they are transactional. We know this because women do not enter into relationships and sleep with men they want nothing from. I mean, that's just the easiest way to disprove that. We don't move towards people and enter into relationships with them when we want nothing from them, especially given the fact that most women enjoy greater optionality in the sexual marketplace than men do. We can assume not only are they entering into relationships and sleeping with the men that they can, that they can transact value with, but that they represent their best possible overall option among their overall optionality in the sexual marketplace. Um, so the rule about romantic relationships is that they are transactional, but they can't feel transactional. In fact, in a good relationship, the transactional is invisible. And the transaction only becomes increasingly explicit as people feel like they're giving more and getting less. Mm. But even if you kind of count, uh, and so one of the rules I, I also have about that is if you're going to have a satisfying relationship, you kind of want to count fuzzily. Like you certainly don't want to keep a spreadsheet of every <laughs> penny spent on both sides to make sure that the financial investment is equal and the childcare investment is equal, like timing people with stopwatches. I mean, that's going to feel controlling and uh, just really ugh, icky, right? One thing, I've, one, one thing I've noticed with a lot of my female coaching clients, and I was a licensed marriage and family therapist for many years before that, is when the emotional intimacy of the relationship goes down. When the woman isn't feeling that the man cares for her, when she doesn't feel that he values her for more than those pieces they're transacting on the spot, if he has no appreciation for her character, for, for whatever that may be, she is not as likely to enjoy the transactions. When you say invisible, I wonder if maybe that's correlated with a higher level of oxytocin in her system, a higher level of serotonin through the relationship features, or... Do you think that that is the transaction? Do you think that she's not getting enough on her end because she's expecting the emotional intimacy component? Is that maybe what you mean? Well, emotional intimacy can be one of the resources that is transacted in a romantic relationship, for sure. I think that everything is perceived through the lens of attraction in romantic relationships. And to have a satisfying relationship, one of the most important things that you can do is maintain a very high level of attraction in your partner because everything will be interpreted more positively and generously with a high level of attraction. So by consequence, is a high level of attraction and something that is kind of an outcome of perceived value. So if a woman is attracted to a man, is it because she thinks that he has a lot to offer her, or is there another factor that's at play here? It's a little bit of both. In fact, one thing I argue in the book is that value and desire are the same thing experienced in different ways. Hmm. So when we talk about, there's a lot of arguments out there about what a high value man is, you know, and that's usually stereotypically presented as an alpha, somebody who is tall, dark, and handsome, makes six or seven figures, high status, famous, six pack, sports car, you know, things like that. The issue with that definition is that there's always going to be exceptions on the individual level. There's going to be individual women out there who hear that definition and say, you know what, those things don't actually matter to me. And let's assume that they're honest and that's an accurate reflection of their perception of value. So there is subjective individual differences in the perception of value. But what happens once we calculate unconsciously whether a person, like the, the benefit we hope to acquire from a given relationship relative to the expense that we anticipate might be expended to acquire and maintain that relationship, that calculus gets transmuted into an emotion. And in the context of romantic relationships, that value gets transmuted into the emotion of desire. So it's kind of axiomatic. To say that a high value man is desirable is sort of like saying a desirable man is desirable. 
which isn't necessarily very satisfying, but it may actually be true on a population level. So one factor to consider here, of course, is what does that woman value, right? At that not, point in time, at that because that'll change. Time. Sure, but it's yeah. also based on that attachment style, security, safety, perception, mm -hmm. environment, uh, what she's been trained to believe is more valuable as well. So one woman may value a man's moral character and, and believe that that is absolutely fundamental. If she's overwhelmingly religious, she may value that aspect in a man. Maybe not to the point where she will marry a homeless religious man, but she she's likely to weight things differently. Whereas, ar arguably, the, the argument that we hear online, the quote-unquote alpha man, is very core pieces of he makes these amounts of money, he provides this safety, he provides the shelter, and nothing else is of value, right? He may have other factors that weight in carefully and differently. There are other parts of society where this plays out really well, and that's actually in the space of business. So there's different types of partnerships at play, and many of the companies that you know you buy things from, Apple being a great example, has a number of very long-term partners that supply its parts. They're actually in a relationship as well that is entirely transactional. They ship parts and money back and forth, but the rules that govern that relationship actually last a very long time. So the difference between customers and partners really lies not just in the space of what is being transacted, but over what time is that game played out. Now, relationships are interesting because we're coming in and we're saying, especially if it's something like marriage, we're going to play out this game together for an indefinite amount of time, a.k.a. until one of us dies or until we both die, depending on where your religious perspective is. So if we're talking about this transactionality of relationships, what impact does this timeline and the way that you approach it have on the way that you bond and connect with your partner? So you guys hit it right there. The calculation of value with respect to our partners fluctuates constantly from second to second over the duration of that relationship. You can think of it like a stock ticker for a, a stock in a market, right? It's constantly fluctuating. And one of the really difficult things about relationships is that we tend to value people more before they give us what we want and less after. Like, you might be willing to pay a great deal for a plumber in an urgent situation <laughs> in your house. But once the plumber comes over and fixes your issue, you don't continue to, play, to pay the plumber. No one continues to pay the plumber after he's done his job. So one of the really difficult things about romantic relationships over the course of a lifetime is that people naturally come to diminish their value in the eyes of their partner as a consequence of giving their partners what they want. And I'd like to challenge you on that, Dr. Ryan, a little bit, because this is the part that I just don't understand personally, and I know a lot of our viewers also do not understand this. So by that consequence, let's say that between Adam and I, let's say that you know we, uh, we were interested in the same woman, and that woman was, say, with me, and then Adam came around and offered her significantly more value in that current instance, at that current time. What is it that prevented her from leaving me for Adam, and then vice versa? What is it that prevents specifically people from transacting with each other and always scaling up? And this is one of the core things that is right now uh, one of the key debates in the community when it comes to, say, the red pill communities and all these other things that say, actually, women will scale up. So until you're constantly increasing your value, and unless you're constantly increasing their value, you will be left behind. I, this, this argument in particular has bothered me tremendously. So I'm curious where you come down on this, Orion is this idea of hypergamy, this idea of monkey branching. The idea is that I, I've been married 15 years, my wife and I have five kids, and the idea is that if my wife has the opportunity to leave me for a man who has 10 more dollars in his pocket, she will immediately do it without conscience, without reservation. This is this concept largely, and I'm, I'm taking it to extremes, yeah. but it's at some point she has a number where she will simply abandon me and my children so that she can go be with a higher value man, quote unquote. Any of it doesn't happen. So what is the mechanism well, that prevents that? It doesn't that? happen with what we would consider healthily attached and healthy people. Sure. It, may yeah. it may happen with personality disorders, certainly, but, but not in that capacity. Orion, I'd love to hear from you on this On this, I point. think it can actually happen with securely attached individuals as well, but it has to be a different value proposition. The reason why it doesn't happen is that there are costs to optimization. Like you could certainly say that within a framework with eight or nine billion people on, on the planet, you might encounter a woman or a man who actually represents a better, good, possible partner for you 
but the costs associated with securing that increase in value may be offset by the expenses incurred by leaving one relationship for the other, so it's actually a net loss or a wash. In the vast majority of cases, if people are happy with their relationships, it's not just that it's $10 more in another person's pocket. That has to represent a significantly better value proposition than their current relationship, and they still have to, that, and that significant difference still has to exceed the costs associated with switching relationships and starting over by a certain amount in that person's mind. And obviously those values can shift based on their satisfaction in the current relationship. Like even a securely attached individual might end up leaving their partner if that person falls on hard times for too long or picks up the bottle and doesn't put it down or in some way becomes more dissatisfying with respect to the quality of that relationship. But there are costs to optimization, which kind of suggests that there is a, there's a certain level at which point it doesn't become reasonable to continue to optimize for the relationship. So you're talking about there a secure partner leaving someone who is actively harming their value inside the relationship versus somebody who simply becomes bored with their partner and happens to wander off for higher value. That, that's a different. Well, that can happen too. So like, for example, one of what I was talking about with the plumber metaphor is that let's say that a man marries a woman. She may not be the most beautiful or attractive woman that uh, he's ever dated or that he could potentially get. But she sees, he sees that the woman has a good maternal instinct, thinks that the woman would be a good mother to his children, and decides to move forward with a long-term relationship on those grounds. Well, what happens 20 years later after she has two children, the children have launched into life? Like, the basis of his selection has now been completely satisfied. She's not going to be having any more children. She's not going to be raising any more children. So on some level, her maternal capacity is moot for the continuation of the relationship. And so on some level, that man will likely value that woman less as a consequence of her giving him what he wanted. That's the tragic that, nature of relationships. To that, what I, would, what I would counter that with is what we see with bonding processes, right? with vasopressin bonding, oxytocin bonding. If she's able to provide, for example, through wisdom, through understanding, through counseling him, through bonding with him in that capacity, if he sees the emotional value in the relationship as higher, he, he may overlook maybe the physical attractiveness elsewhere. He may mm -hmm. find new value in her. Is that possible in your eyes? Oh, that's certainly true. And that's what I'm saying is that like once the, the toilet has been unclogged, there has to be some other reason to keep the plumber around. Understood. Right? Understood. And that has to be something that the other person values. So it's not so much... I mean, that woman might be the wisest woman in the world, but if that man is not in the market for wisdom, it's not going to work. So this is why we see many, many men who are maybe more avoidantly attached, who are on the cortisol dopamine pathway, blocking the oxytocin receptors, not doing the vasopressin bonding. This is why we see those men often throw away even valuable, loving, caring, nurturing partners because he's not getting that proper dopamine fix because he doesn't value her that way. So the transactions are zero on his side. So th there's another connection that we're seeing between this and the business world, and that is a change right now in societal um, behaviors towards association with long-term brand building. So to simplify this into relationship terms, we like to live in a story that we don't want to end. So often when a person becomes connected, you're both you know, prominent content creators, People will follow you for the rest of their lives because you have provided them with an experience they simply don't want to replace or end because you have your unique value that there is no other Dr. Ryan, there is no Adam Lane Smith. When I was working Jordan Pearson, there is no other Jordan Pearson and they can do whatever they want. You know, you guys can write a book and sing a song and people will still buy that even if it's full of pictures, right? It's basically going to be the experience you've already provided. And men especially have this concept of loyalty and honor and whatnot that, you know, plays in different parts in different societies to different degrees of importance. But nonetheless, living a good life, living a good life with a committed partner, one that you can be proud of and reflect on as opposed to kind of discard as soon as, you know, she can no longer bear your children and your obligations to your prior children have been satisfied, that also has its own value. And that value is not extrinsic to us. It is internal to the way that we see ourselves because that's base, the basis upon which men respect themselves. Do you think that's something that plays out in the decision-making process at all, Dr. Ryan, or is this something that's maybe different? No, it's certainly true. A long time ago, I made an episode on my channel. It was one of my first that was called Everyone is Unique and Everyone is Replaceable. 
And both of those two things are true at the same time, and that's true of everyone. It's like, yes, if I were to stop making content today, there would be somebody else who might represent traditional psychology to come in and speak to these issues about relationships. But that person is not going to have my certain je ne sais quoi or the, my way of being, right? And so one of the best ways to guard a, your own replaceability in any kind of relationship, whether it's personal or professional, is to emphasize your unique idiosyncratic contributions to that relationship. It's like the taste. You know, mm -hmm. you can get bolognese at pretty much every Italian restaurant, but there's that one place that makes it with that combination of spices that you just can't get anywhere else. And that's what's going to keep you coming back. The and if they sauce. go under a new owner, you're going to, you're going to miss that. It's not going to be the same. And I'm actually very curious. The red pill community, the one, you know, in its classic, classic definition, you know, the alpha male, you know, six feet, six figures, six pack, six whatever else, um, like that is the one thing that actually completely ignore in the way that they approach the world. They tend to say, hey, I'm now a quantifiable number of metrics and I'm competing in the same metrics with a specific population and my job was to get to the top. Now, how do you quantify this unique attachment? Because I know a lot of females are obsessed with that. First of all, they see more shades of color than any man ever could. <laughs> you know, they have a wider, wider range of smells. Like, their attention to uncanny detail is phenomenal. And in many ways, it seems like they use that to bond and also hyper-classify people into very unique categories that are irreplaceable to them. Yeah, so this is actually a pretty nuanced idea. I have a whole chapter of my book devoted to understanding what sexual marketplace value is. So the first thing I'll say is that a lot of people listen to some of the content online, especially men, and they think, okay, I need the six sixes, I need to have a high status job, I need to have the abs, uh, I need to be that leader of men. And some men despair of ever being that because of their height, because of their hair, because of their body type. And they think, well, I could just never be an alpha, right? The issue with thinking that way, I call those things attraction proxies because they don't actually substitute for attraction. People like to think that they will, but you certainly don't need any of those things to attract high quality partners into your life. And the danger is that men will think, oh, all I need is X number of dollars. All I need is the six pack. And then the women will, will be lining up. And let me tell you, that's, that's not actually true. Mm. It's very difficult to perceive net worth. It's very difficult to perceive character you know, on site. It's not something that can be assessed by women very quickly, right? So the idea that you need these things and then relationships with women will become effortless for men is a fallacy, okay? Now, let's be real, though. There are, let's say, archetypal standards of beauty in our culture that are probably biologically determined and culturally informed. Mm -hmm. And so I say that a man and a, or a woman's, that like the, the extent to which they approximate the archetypal standards of beauty in their culture, I call their normalized sexual marketplace value. We all know that certain people are more beautiful or attractive than others. And it's absolute lunacy to contend otherwise, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that that conventionally beautiful or attractive person is going to be beautiful or attractive to a specific individual. When we talk about normalized sexual marketplace value, we're talking on a statistical or population level that in general, women prefer men who are taller. In general, women prefer men who make more money. All those things are true when all other things are controlled and equal, right? But the preferences of any given individual can and do deviate significantly from those cultural norms and expectations. That's why I call that perceived sexual marketplace value, and that's really the determinant as to whether any man is going to be attractive to any given woman. The issue is that exists entirely within the minds of the perceiver, and the perceiver, him or herself, may not be, and generally isn't, fully conscious of the apparatus that determines their level of attraction to any given individual. Like Adam, you talked about earlier that morals or ethics or virtue might be more important for some women than others. That's absolutely true. But in general, that's not a ticket to high attraction. If it, I mean, the world would look very different if women slept with virtuous men. 
Like if that was their primary metric of attraction, like they could completely change the dynamic of humanity if that were true. But we know that it's not. Well, we tried to play in that space. And historically, there were times when we were closer to that than we are now for sure, because they were higher. They had higher value status in society. But right now, this is actually part of the problem is that we are so splintered that we have no idea what is truly valuable to us. And you have subdivisions of even the American society that truly believe that these more virtuous men are high valuable, especially more religious societies, especially maybe more subcultural societies, uh, different ethnicities valued in different ways. But in general, we have no norm anymore of what a high value man is. I'm kind of curious, Dr. Ryan, when your definition, what is a high value man? Well, a high value man is a man that is desired highly by the woman in question, which is not a very satisfying answer, but it's probably the truest answer you're going to get. That is actually a very good answer, I think. Why? Well, because if you took my wife, for example, and if you took, uh, let's say, a 40-year-old hyper-liberal feminist from New York City, and you sat them down and said, which of these men would you want to spend time with? Which of these men would you want to date or marry or sleep with? Both women are very likely to choose very different men in that capacity because they will value tremendously different things, especially if they have trauma history, one of them or the other one doesn't. Uh, if one of them is very avoidant and, and tries to stay away from commitment and being trapped, if one of them is approval seeking, uh, if there's there so many different capacities with that. even preferences of what they saw their father grow up with or, or whatever it might be. My daughters right now are, my wife says, who do you want to marry when you grow up? And my daughters all say, a man with a red beard. And of course, dad has a red beard. <laughs> all of my daughters say this. So it's, it will be vastly different based on the woman in question. Mm. This is true. And that's interesting, right? Because that's actually does not help anybody at all, right? And this is part of the problem because especially if you're a young man, and especially if you're a man who's trying to discover himself. Fantastic, guys. Thank you very much. What do I do now? Do I go to the gym? Do I read books? Do I, you know, practice my virtues? Do I save up for a red Ferrari? Like, what is, what is the right thing to do here if you do not have that clarity and you do not have access to a statistically significant population of women that can rank you, well, aside from Tinder? It's, it's just like, I want to start a business. I want to sell a product. Fantastic. Who do you want to sell that product to? Everyone in the entire world, good luck. You will never, never build marketing that is appropriate to that niche because you will never appeal to everyone in the entire world. Unless you're selling water, right? Water is the one thing everyone on the planet needs. <laughs> if it's food, you are still going to have to niche down into a specific subgroup. So, okay, young men, what specific market niche are you targeting? Are you looking for a woman who would go on Fresh and Fit and be on Fresh and Fit, one of, one of the women on there? Are you looking for a woman who is a complete porn star on the street kind of thing? Are you looking for a woman who goes and, and spends her days in a, in a religious setting with a veil on her head? Which type of woman are you trying to market to, right? And there's a plethora of specific variables then that you can target into to niche into that. Yeah, this is really juicy. So uh, I made an episode a while ago called Most Men Are Wallpaper in the sense that most men do not stand out from the undifferentiated field of men as focus. And that's really strange because in the natural world, it's generally the males who stand out with their displays. It's like the peacocks, not the peahens who have the remarkable plumage, right? And that's a sign of both physical health and sexual vigor in their displays to the females of their species, right? But in in our culture, in Western society, it's the women who tend to be more visually dazzling than the men who seem to have like three different kinds of looks, right? So <laughs> what I sometimes suggest is that men should be a slightly exaggerated version of themselves and to kind of lean in and to not be afraid of taking a, a little bit of a risk with respect to their personal presentation. This will result in being less attractive to more people, but more attractive to a small minority of people. And in general, if only 1% of women find you highly attractive, that is way more women than you'll ever be able to deal with in your entire lifetime. It's better to be more, very attractive to a small subset of women than to be m less attractive to m a greater proportion of women. If a man wants to be long-term happy in 2024, long-term happy, 
Do you have a specific subgroup of women that he might want to focus on courting primarily as a long-term mate? Hmm. Well, in America, it's, it's tough to find those women that you might want to settle down with. Of course, men are very different. Um, I have found it to be very useful to uh, enter into relationships with the children of immigrants. I think that they're actually a fantastic population for American men to potentially relate to. Often they grew up in a sort of cultural bubble that lended them guardianship against some of the more contemporary social norms in American society. Uh, immigrants and the children of immigrants are usually very hardworking. They tend to be very highly educated. They tend to be very ambitious, industrious, conscientious, not always. Um, but I find those women to be of it's easier to potentially enter into long-term relationships with those women, I found, personally. What, what, to your eyes, makes American women less attractive to men who are looking for long-term mating in that way? Well, I think if you talk to a lot of guys, they tell you that American women, they want more for less on some level. Like, they're, they're more expensive, and you might get less in the context of your long-term relationships than you might from a woman from a different culture, right? And I think that's because within the tenets of ideological feminism, a lot of the values that men traditionally have derived from women in their long-term relationships are now, you know, they're marketed as beneath the dignity of women to perform, like housework, raising children, um, femininity, uh, sweet agreeableness. Like, none of these characteristics are in line with the boss mentality. Which <laughs> yeah, is, but they're also not know, being marketed right now as valuable, right? If you go into media, you do not see, you know, kind, sweet, you know, home-caring uh, girls being promoted. It is exactly the op opposite persona that being, it is being marketable because it is largely abrasive to very many people. And I know one thing about social media, that abrasive brings views. Right, abrasive is a thing that makes people want to go say, "What is that about?" And over time, we've created this image, uh, actually an unrealistic image of people, by cre combining multiple personas into one through artificial means, be it through means of media design, um, you know, just presentation, music, movies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's very few people that actually meet that type of persona in real life and are actually authentic about it. It's very largely a construct. So we have a large population of American women who get exposed to this from a very young age who actually are trying to be something that it's almost impossible for a human to be, and they get mad when their efforts are not met with what they said they were going to be met with. So there's a big disconnect in that story that is being told. And one thing I can tell you about American women, too, is that they are very angry at being told what's practically a lie about men and about themselves. And that hurts. But that's very difficult for a man to handle, right? We cannot fix your hurt if you're a woman uh, that came from your parents and your society and everywhere else. And that's why I think a lot of men just find someone else, yeah. as dark as that sounds. We're, we're, right now, I know, that, I know that we're moving into a space where the largest demographic in America, especially the largest voting demographic and the largest uh, money spending demographic, is going to be single, childless women who are in their 30s, 40s, that's going to be the largest demographic in America very, very soon, they say within the next five to 10 years. And they are fairly angry. They are seeking stimulation. And they, many of them are just barely beginning to wake up to the idea that maybe the life that they have been offered or sold is not a life that will be satisfying to them long term. Do you agree, Do you agree Dr. Ryan? Is that a trend that you're seeing as a psychologist? I see that. Uh, I don't see a lot of women in their 40s waking up to that possibility personally. I often see them doubling down on their position. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, what region of the country maybe are you talking about or are you talking about online? I'm, I'm in California, Northern California, but I do consultations with folks all over the world, men and women. Got it, got it, okay. Mm -hmm. 
I know that there. So I'm I, I, I'm all over the place. Grew up in California. California, I would 100 percent agree with you on that capacity. The two coasts, obviously. Um, down the center where I live is is the Midwest, and I travel around through a lot through the Midwest. Talk to a lot of people there. There does seem to be different different values there. There's a lot of women who are more minded uh, around family, not all of them by any means, and it definitely differs by state. Minnesota is one of those states that probably is more following the way of California. Wisconsin is one of those states that's more following the older pathways, for example, and they're split by a river. So Mm -hmm. there's definitely pockets of this, and and the macro culture is definitely causing a massive division. Um, Well, you can't have opposites in the culture the way that... uh, you guys have opposites here and then expect nothing bad to happen because there's so much tension that's being released in the way of even just just look at the just look at the comments after this video gets posted you're going to get like 15,000 you know different viewpoints everybody's thinking they're right and there's no commonality between them so that there's a lot of energy that is already existing in these systems because nobody can decide what to do. And that's actually why I like some of the work that you guys are, are, are doing practically in the way that you're coaching and you're helping people fix that understanding and come to some degree of uh, independence from that mass madness that's escalating as opposed to getting getting better. Mm. Uh, now, I'm actually very curious in that space too, Dr. Ryan, uh, this conversation around anxious and avoidant attachment really popped when we started working with Adam. I mean, Adam has contributed significantly to the conversation as well uh, about the connection between anxious and avoidant. But as you know, classically trained psychologists, what is your standpoint on that particular framework? The attachment framework? Attachment in framework, general. anxious avoidant, that is very popular right now. Everybody's self-identifying. Adam yeah. has now Adam has now expanded it. Now there's what, six of them? Eight. Eight. Now there's eight subcategories of uh, oh, uh, yeah, of attachment. So I know the traditional four. Uh, so you know, I studied attachment theory in grad school and it has a robust evidence base. Uh, I'm sure you both are aware that the attachment styles initially were developed out of the strange encounter experiment, which was conducted on toddlers. Now, obviously, what happens at certain points of our lives can be critical for the rest of our uh, you know, lifespans. But I do believe that some of the attachment theories have been, let's say, overextended into the popular imagination. And I don't, and sometimes I feel like they're being used to sort of explain everything about a person's personality or relationship style. Where people and are using the more like astronomy, astrology signs and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, it's like Myers-Briggs. You know, yeah. you, if you know that I am an INTJ and you know that I'm anxiously attached and you know that, uh, geez, I don't know, uh, that I'm a Libra, you're supposed to kind of understand what you might be dealing with if you enter into a relationship with me. As if all of those things can, can speak for me as my own proxy. I don't it, think that's true. I'm curious to see what you'll think of this. So when I started doing all this work on attachment, Andre, you remember, you guys were pushing me, pushing me to talk about the core pieces in, in the attachment styles. And I said, no, I refused to talk about attachment styles for the first year. And I would say you are either an attached person or a detached person, because I did not want people picking up the styles and saying, this is my sign. I'm an Aries and therefore everyone has to deal with it and it will never change. I, I, I firmly believe that attachment is the foundation of everything, but it, it's not the core. It's, it's not the definitive at the end of the day of who you are, but it is a piece you do need to lock in so you can really cultivate who you are, is my expression. I think it can also change. And it must time. change. Like, I don't think that a person's going to go from being anxious, avoidant, to anxious, insecure, like to switch the polarity across that spectrum. But... When I was a younger man, I was definitely more avoidant than I am today. I'm probably right on the cusp of avoidant and secure. And I think that I was able to heal some of the attachment wounding that I experienced when I was a young person through all kinds of different experiences. But it's certainly possible to, uh, to change that, to influence that. It's not easy to do. It'll take some years to reprogram that. But it's certainly possible. And what I also noticed over the course of that time is that the types of women that I was organically attracted to shifted as a consequence. Yes. Of my yes. Now I'm excited. I'm excited to get into this because the research shows and research is, is not perfect, but the research indicates that among the boomers, they had attachment issues of about 35% insecure and about 65% secure around millennials, Gen X, Gen Y. The research indicates maybe about 50 to 50, 50, 50 
And now the research is more indicating about a 65% insecure rate among Gen Z and a 35% secure rate. Now, again, you know as well as I do, populations are not perfect, but it, it appears to be showing us that the attachment issues are increasing as society is breaking down, as families are separating, as we're seeing those, those core pockets and the safety nets deteriorating, families are, are, are not forming secure attachments with children, then we're seeing that echo across into dopamine seeking behaviors, safety seeking behaviors. I'm wondering, uh, my thought on this, I'd love professional to professional to get your thought on this. It seems like that breakdown and that insecurity is leading a shift in the value that we are seeking in partners out in the world where it's more high value men will bring money and safety and there is nothing else that high value men can bring in some women and men are saying high value women will bring fertility they will bring sex and that's about all that they can really offer i'm wondering if that's leading a lot of that breakdown between male and female value separation what do you think there i wonder like it's certainly possible that the distribution of attachment styles will shift from generation to generation. I mean, one could plausibly make the argument that, you know, in communist Romania, there were a lot more disorganized, <laughs> attached children because there were so many of them growing up in orphanages because of the various uh, laws and uh, incentives in place. So that makes sense to me. What is less clear to me is how we define insecure attachment. Like some people, I'm not saying that this is you, Adam, but I think that some people use the outcome or relationship status as a means to diagnose a person's attachment style. Like if you're a certain age and you're not married or you're not in a relationship, that must mean that you have a fear of commitment or you must be somehow anxiously or avoidantly attached. Otherwise, you would be in a long-term relationship by now. And that's certainly possible, but I think it's also possible that there are other reasons why people are partnering up at lower rates that may not have to do with attachment styles. And that has to do with, let's say, the value proposition associated with marriage and long-term relationships. Even securely attached people might decide that something is a greater cost or expense than the likely benefit that they hope to receive. And well, and securely attached people, the way I've been able to differentiate it is they are the ones who are the most clear about transactions. They're the ones who are who are able to have the the straightforward conversation about transactional value. They are they are also the ones though who are likely to count emotional content, character content, virtue into that transactional piece because they're not just focused on raw survival or appeasing. They, they don't keep they don't keep that level of secrecy. They're not approval seeking. They don't downgrade their value. They don't overinflate their value. They're they're just able to be very clear and direct, and then have those clear transactions. Versus maybe an avoidant person would would overinflate their sense of safety, and they may not have any sense at all of the value that someone could bring emotionally to the relationship because they haven't experienced that intimacy component. Versus an anxious person who is not likely to share any of their expectations up front. They're going to ambush the other person by, by paying them endlessly and then the bill comes due. That, that's what I have seen. I, I'm fully in agreement with this. What are your thoughts there, Andre, on that? You look skeptical. Go I for look, it. I look skeptical because ultimately I think it kind of, kind of comes down back to this idea of what is it that we value, mm -hmm. right? And I think there is a point, absolutely, that comes in a relationship when a person becomes securely attached and they want bond, uh, make a bond with another partner, at which point they become bonded for life, at which point where many, many things can happen and even the worst case scenario of illness or death when the other person's value completely dimish, diminishes, they will never leave. Like There is almost like a switch that happens. It doesn't happen with everybody. It doesn't happen in all marriages, unfortunately. And that's why they have so many stories about people finding you know, their soulmates and all of that. Now, I know you really don't like that term. No, I, I hate the really term soulmates. You really hate it. You really go it makes off my skin crawl. It. Why? The idea that there is one and only one person out there who is able to somehow magically click in with you and they will fulfill every single need you have and you simply have to find them has been the backbone of so much excuse 
to break up families, right? To to go out and do destructive things. And it isn't as amazing that the people who use the term soulmate typically find the new soulmate every five Rather or six soon. months, right? Yeah. They, they, they find <laughs> themselves with, in bed with that person every so often. And, and only by jumping into bed as fast as humanly possible can they determine that that person was their soulmate. And, and isn't it funny they have eight or ten different soulmates in the course of, of a decade? Well, they justify that as them seeking for their soulmate and yeah. people disappointing them time and time again. Um, ultimately, I think these are all just components of a system that people will need to create for themselves based on a number of different components. I think value, your value, the value of your partner absolutely needs to be part of the vetting criteria. Your attachment, you know, anxious attachment if you're on the spectrum or uh, avoid attachment if you're on that spectrum, they all have to become part of your consideration. But ultimately, it's going to be the life that you want to live and the story you want to tell yourself that you have to keep in mind. And you have to project that forward far enough to say, am I going to be making mistakes now that are going to lead me astray? You also need some things that are constant in your life and that are absolutes and their principles, in my opinion. So, for example, if you truly value marriage and you say, well, I'm going to consider this to be as a lifelong commitment, then you kind of have to treat it, I think, as a lifelong commitment. Otherwise, you're going to be passing on the experience. Now, marriage is something that is very debated right now, and I'm very curious, Dr. Ryan, in terms of marriage, do you think that's an institute that is going to disappear? Is it going to transform? Are we going back to traditional marriage? Where are we heading with this? I don't think it will disappear entirely. It's certainly going to be less relevant moving forward into the future. It will still be very important for subgroups of humanity, especially among the religious and those with more traditional and conservative values. But we can see that an institution that fails more often than it succeeds, if we just look at the divorce rates, and certainly not every marriage that doesn't get divorced is a happy, satisfying one. It has a fairly low success rate. We can conservatively estimate that as one in four. Like a relationship structure that has a 25% success rate should absolutely not be marketed as the monolithic solution to heterosexual relationships. I think that's reckless and irresponsible. The issue is that we don't have any sane and compelling alternatives to marriage right now, especially when it comes to long-term relationships. And so a lot of people have this Hobson's choice between, let's say, entering into an institution that may not actually serve their best interests or nothing at all. And a lot of people would rather have an imperfect solution than nothing at all, regardless of the risks and expenses involved. But I do believe that there's an opportunity here. I think that the traditional institution of marriage is falling apart. And I think it's falling apart because, in part, we want it to be too many things. Like the traditional institution of marriage is very, very humble. And it wasn't designed to support all of the other things that the modern marriage is expected to be. Like, for example, marriage was never expected to be a passionate adventure with a lover. It was never expected to be a, a really deep bond with your best friend. It wasn't expected to be a... Um, your, your spouse your spouse being your therapist, your spouse being everything to your you. Accountability Every human partner, in, your, in your life. Right. You have no other friends but your partner, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely gotten yeah. a lot more complicated, but then there's also a question of what are the expectations that are coming with it. Part of the big objection to the traditional marriage institute is often the financial risks that are associated and the now increasingly difficult legal situation, plus the fact that people just seem to care less. I mean, people seem to want to leave marriage as like overnight. I don't see as a man what benefit I accrue from marriage that I don't have as a single man. For, from my perspective, the, insti the legal institution of marriage is nothing but risk and downside. So this is an interesting fact. So the purpose of marriage actually is not really, generally speaking, the innate uh, core happy experience maybe of the, of the individual. If we're looking at marriage and romance as it's designed to make you happy, <clears throat> you might consider one in four marriages a success and three in four a failure. You could say that. If we look at, for example, the success rate of children, if we look at the, the benefit to children of marriage, what are your thoughts there? Well, I think that the fundamental purpose of marriage is to provide a stable context in which to raise children. Like, that's what it is. And, every, and that became a necessity once people started living in communities that were larger than a certain number. 
You know, we see this in very small tribal communities. We don't have nuclear families there. It's like the children really were raised by a village. But once the communities became large enough, you might not know everybody in them, and it's harder and harder to divert your own, let's say, privatized resources to raise another person's children. So the context of marriage became a necessity to prevent children from just sort of like running wild and untutored and malnourished in the streets, basically. Um, but I don't think it was designed to be a love partnership. In fact, most marriages historically, you saw romance and love outside of the context of that relationship. Well, and, and to that point, we actually see among arranged marriages, they have about a 1% divorce rate, but they actually report the highest happiness rates of any marriage st structure on earth. Yeah, part of that low divorce rate might still be that arranged marriages are practiced in cultures with very, no divorces allowed. It's very difficult. But, yeah. but, the happiness, but the happiness ratings are off the charts compared to sure. even American marriages. Romantic marriages actually have the lowest happiness ratings. Well, the because, best ways to be satisfied in relationships is just to have low expectations. Yeah, and like that's want actually... want fewer yeah. things from your partner, and you won't be disappointed. And why do you think that one person should or can satisfy all of your different interpersonal needs? I mean, that's just ludicrous. It is. It is foolish. Well, it's a question of value, right? So initially, you're right in the sense that we actually sold marriages as the be-all and all and all solution to your loneliness problem, your, compassion, uh, your companionship problem, your financial problem your psychological and spiritual and physical well-being problem, your sexual problem, um, your you know lineage problem, your child care and home care problem, and you're just basically starting to stack it across the board. Now, the challenge is that can it be a solution to all of those? Yes, but not right away, first of all, and not solely, because you're going to need additional support structures and also processes and systems build within that context. Like, what does it take to build a functional family? That's a lot of work. Well, and, and women in particular, um, it's fascinating on the research, when they only have one relationship, this is based on the work of Dr. Sukarta of the Kinsey, Kinsey Institute, but when they have one core relationship, just, just their boyfriend or just their husband, their anxiety actually goes up. Oh yeah. By bonding with that one person, their anxiety gets worse than, than if they were alone. But once they level out and have multiple healthy, functioning, intimate, emotionally intimate relationships, their husband, their boyfriend, their mom, their sister, their cousin, their friend, all this network, then the pressure on that one relationship decreases and they, they calm down. Their anxiety levels go down. They actually have higher life satisfaction and one could extrapolate their marriage would be happier because mm -hmm. it's not so, so pressured. So if it's maybe not marriage itself as the institution that is the core issue, um, what do you gentlemen recommend then to build around your marriage to ensure that you're not on one of the divorce statistics? Well, I do believe we're entering into an opportunity here. There's certainly a crisis. Relationships are falling apart in real time. Sometimes relationship structures that have existed for hundreds or thousands of years. It's a very interesting moment to be living through. But we don't have to allow them to fall apart entirely and we don't necessarily have to build them back up just the way that they were. Because the way that they were built might in some way be responsible for why they're falling apart today, mm. among other things. What will you change, Dr. Ryan, in the way that marriages would work? If you can rewrite any law, if you can make it effective immediately and actually have it implemented, what would you do differently? I'd prefer not to regulate behavior through laws. I mean, that's sort of a last ditch effort to try to control human behavior. Um, if you did want to go that way, you would probably have to make marriage more financially safe for men. I mean, it's becoming almost every man that I know either is or knows somebody very closely who has been completely destroyed by divorce, either financially or emotionally or both. It is a very difficult process. It's much more difficult for men than women in general by a huge margin. And I think that if you want more men to eagerly participate in the institution, it needs to be more aligned with their own interests. Uh, otherwise, there would, there, all the laws or shame-based campaigns or social coercions won't be necessary. Like if men saw marriage to be aligned with their best interests, they would be lining up at the courthouse 
in general, they kind of believe that it's more in the woman's best interest, which it definitely is, and they see it as a necessary sacrifice to retain a relationship. Or to build a family or to satisfy religious concerns, yeah. Hmm. Well, here's a question then. So we're talking about value from the perspective of relationship. So on one side, you know, we have the man who's coming in and he's offering the stability and the ability to provide resources and care and support for the rest of the woman's life. But on the other side, uh, in a classical sense, she's providing him the opportunity to have children. So can we truly put a value on children? Or is it that once you have a child together, then the value that the woman has provided by the creation of life, uh, multiple lives potentially, does that supersede and override everything else that the man has potentially been able to give her prior to that? Does he now owe her a debt for the rest of his life, which is a very common thing that people do talk about, even in religious circles, as something that they must now stick to and kind of be loyal to and repay and, uh, and deliver on for the rest of their lives together? Yeah, it's a tricky one. In general, the game does not run on gratitude. Like banking on gratitude is unfortunately not a very safe bet. Uh, Robert Greene talks about that in his 48 Laws of Power. Um, that's not generally what maintains relationships is debts of gratitude, unfortunately. The world would look very differently if that were true. Now, you have to be careful, though. It's like it's certainly possible to have children outside of a marriage. In fact, in some demographics in American society, most children are born outside of wedlock in today's day and age. Like I think about 30% of children born to white mothers are born in unwed partnerships, and it's much higher in other demographics. So we can and do reproduce and, and make children and raise children outside of the context of marriage. I don't think you technically need to be married to raise kids, but if you want to, I mean, to my mind, it's the only reason why you would want to get married. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to have kids, just be two consenting adults who want to spend time with each other. There's like no reason to become so legally and logistically entangled. Well, to that, um, I can contradict that about myself. So I am, I am deeply Catholic myself, uh, very, very Catholic, uh, whatever that means, very, I very, suppose. Very, Catholic. very, very, very Catholic. <laughs> Um, and what's interesting is we're seeing a massive rise in numbers of Catholics all over the world, not just because we're massively producing by, like rabbits, uh, <laughs> but currently the numbers of Catholics is, is an estimated 1.25 billion across the world. That number is expected to go up to about 1.6 billion based on convert numbers right now by 2030. Over the next six years, they're expecting another 300,000 because we're seeing massive conversions all over the world. Million. By 300 million, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, we're seeing an increase in some capacities with religion. Uh, in other areas, we're seeing decreases in some religious demographics. Obviously, in evangelical Christians often are going down versus Catholics are going up. Again, based on current numbers. So if religious values come into play, then we could see a return to reasons to get married, for example, with that. Uh, men, again, would have to value religious beliefs. They'd have to value those pieces. That would create a different value system. But we have to understand that marriage is a conflation right now of two ideas. There's the religious institution, which is, let's say, a solemn oath before God to bring two people into spiritual union with one another mm -hmm. for the context and the duration of their lives. And there's also a legal entanglement that people enter into to share property under such and such terms and to get certain tax breaks and etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can have one or the other or both or neither those two things unfortunately go by the same name but are very very different this is true civil unions versus religious marriage mm -hmm. this yes. is a fact like do you think that catholics could get married without signing the legal marriage license i think over the course of 2000 years we certainly have uh, we look there at Saint, Saint Valentine, for example, was, was martyred for marry, marrying people who were not supposed to be married at the time for various reasons. Um, the Irish, during the occupation of Ireland under Britain, was, was famous. They would get married secret, in secret so that they wouldn't have to do various other things. It, we, we, we certainly can have marriage without that, but there does need to be an external governing force that still holds those people together. It, could be, it, it should be their community and their families. I don't think it needs to be the legal state. Mm -hmm. uh, in that capacity. It, it could be their community, their personal, private, local community. There, there should be some aspect there, but again, it, it should be balanced. 
the state itself is, is certainly not a good clear arbiter because that's that's going to fall well, down let's look the, at the history of reality. Right? Initially, marriage was exactly that. It was a spiritual ceremony. It's not like you could go back to the 1830s or even 1930s and have the level of legal battles that we're currently having now. <laughs> that was just not the thing. No, it was would, only maybe in the last maybe 70 years or so that we introduced you know marriage and law together, and then all of a sudden, it's like this little bait and switch. You take out their spirituality. Right now, marriages have no spiritual value in the vast majorities of people's definitions, especially not in the secular sense. And now they're truly just institutions that are regulated by pieces of paper to get you some tax breaks. And you, you do that. Like most, most men who get married now, they don't even know why they're getting married. So here's an interesting thought. Have we, have we reached the end of legal marriage? And what we're going to see is people who have more of a spiritual bend to them are going to get married perhaps in a non-legal sense and or even maybe fall into the legal sense but people who don't have a spiritual bend are likely not to fall into that marriage piece do you think that might be the divide that we see yeah i think that's likely i mean i was contacted by a law firm a few months back they're specializing in what they call alt marriages so ways to memorialize a legal union between people that differ significantly from the standard contract that the state provides when you sign a marriage license. And I think that the opportunity to the relationship crisis that we're currently passing through is that we have a chance to examine and really tease out all of these various components that have been mushed together into this hyper-conflated idea of modern marriage. Like, for example, Potentially, if two people wanted to raise children together, they might conceivably enter into, let's say, a 20-year agreement to do that as co-parents. And there would be no need necessarily for some sort of nasty, bitter, acrimonious, and expensive divorce. The terms of the contract potentially might just end. And those two people could cohabitate or they could not. They could be monogamous sexual partners or they could not. They could develop deep abiding love for each other, or they might not. They could agree to help each other in ways outside of the co-parenting relationship, or they might not. It's like, I think that the opportunity here is that we might be able to craft relationships that are more custom tailored to the individuals actually within them, as opposing to saying either, if you want to get married, you have to live together, you have to have kids, you have to have the ceremony and the legal oath and the solemn oath before God, you have to be each other's best friends, you have to be each other's monopolized sex dealers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like either all of that or nothing, which is a terrible choice for a lot of people to to decide between. And I don't but think it's I guess it's, it's ultimately anymore. the question there lies is, do people know what will make them happy? Right? Because part of the argument here, especially if you're talking to spiritual religious arguments, saying that if and only if you enter into this lifelong union, the purpose of which is going to be children and to support each other and to provide for each other, let's say in a classical biblical definition, that is the only way in which you will reach happiness and in the spiritual sense, salvation. Right? That, is, that is going to be the way and the only way because that's the way that you have been designed as humans. Now, what you're suggesting potentially, Dr. Ryan, is that we're going to have we, we have the ability to customize it. But if I'm, say, a young person, you know, let's say if I was 20 or 25 and I fell in love with this girl and I sat down and my 20 year old self and I remember my 20 year old self, self that, that guy wasn't particularly smart, uh, at least not in, in the practical sense. And then, I, you know, if I had to lay out what I thought my life should be for the next 20 years, thinking that being maybe non-monogamous would make me happy, thinking that having a 20-year-old term on this contract that we're going to craft would make me happy. And then I started building towards that. I could easily find far too late that it wasn't the case. And then the traditional way of doing things actually was the way. And then I would have looked back and I said, I wish you would have done this for me. I wish you would have told me that I'm being an idiot and I'm being, you know, rushed by my hormones and the lack of a lack of a brain per se. Um, and then that was the way I should have followed. Because I'll give you an example. I've worked with a lot of people in the content space. I've known a lot of people who have made a lot of money and they have actually deployed those types of relationships with or without, you know, the actual legal paperwork. They had all the money they needed to make sure they were safe. And they lived the lifestyle with their non-monogamous. They lived the lifestyle with multiple partners or partners that were temporary. And at the end of that lifestyle, they were deeply regretful because they actually strayed away from the path. 
So I guess the question here, Dr. Ryan, is do you think there's a universal path to happiness that is going to be there for the vast majority of people, or do we have to decide what that is now individually and, and figure it out on our own? Yeah, it's a great question. I agree with Adam on this one. I don't think that the purpose of marriage is to be happy. If mm. there is a purpose, I think it's to provide a stable context in which to raise children. And we can think of a marriage almost like starting a small business. And it's like there's the CEO and the COO, and we're coming together with complementary skill sets. You don't need two CFOs, right? So you're going to handle this because that's in your wheelhouse. I'm going to handle these things. And between the two of us, we're going to have enough resources, expertise, and knowledge to be able to get this enterprise off the ground and succeed in our mission, which I think is the raising of children in a safe and stable context. Now, I would also push back on you gently, Andre, because you're absolutely right. Like a lot of 20, 25 year olds, myself included, we're very stupid. And we can't really expect young people to make very reasoned, mature decisions with respect to the rest of their lives, right? And it certainly is possible that somebody at 25 might enter into one of these 20 year contracts that I'm hypothetically proposing and then realize, you know what, this wasn't for me. I wish that I had taken the more conservative traditional path from the get-go. That is absolutely a possibility. However, we've already run the other study, which is that 20, 25-year-olds are getting married in the traditional sense. And we know that 20 years later, a lot of them are saying, get me out of this contract. <laughs> like we, we know how often people break the traditional marriage institution. We don't yet know how often people are gonna be dissatisfied with the alternatives. And you might make the argument that, you know, even if after 20 years you realize that this didn't work for you, that that might be preferable to a lifetime. There is a component to marriage that involves self-development, right? Saying that I'm now going through a difficult experience and knowing that there is no way out and knowing that you have to get through it sometimes are the things that drive people to become their highest, best elevated selves, they really to learn things that you would not have otherwise learned. I'm personally a proponent of going all in and going deep and going one way in some certain experiences because only when you get to your absolute maximum capacity do you get to evolve, progress and grow as a human. Um, can you live an easy life? Yes, you can. You know, you can live a pleasant life. But is that going to get you to your biggest and best capacity as a, a partner, as a father, as a man, right? That's a question that you have to ask. And I guess ultimately, if your goal is to say, I'm looking for uh, feelings of safety in a place where I can change my mind, and then maybe in 10 years, 20 years, or if, you know, clause C on page 23 is executed uh, within the right term, then I can run away to Bali with a, with a neighborhood pool boy or pool girl, whatever, right? That is going to be the thing that you really have to decide you want to live. But eventually there is a strong benefit to saying now forever and forever and ever thereafter. And that is going to hold you accountable to whatever it is you're going to become. I think the first question that men have to answer then is not about what type of security and what type of safety they want for themselves. Because right now, they're, they're already diminishing themselves. They're already giving themselves an exit clause. But rather, what type of man and what type of life they intend to be as they grow through these different stages. And sometimes burning a bridge is the best thing you could possibly do. Well, and I have, I, obviously, I have tremendous, tremendous faith in, in marriage itself as a good institution. Maybe not with the legal aspects on it, but lifelong marriage. But to that, to that idea, um, we have to add that a marriage cannot exist in a vacuum. It, it, it just can't. The idea that two people alone in a relationship are going to live in a vacuum perpetually is, is, is beyond foolish. So we do need to fix the larger connections there. We need to fix the support networks, the families, the communities. We need to fix an expectation that if you were in a lifelong bond, what does that mean? What are your responsibilities in that lifelong bond? What, what are, who is going to enforce that upon you? It cannot be the state. It cannot be you will be fined X amount of money if you are not attractive enough to your husband or if you, whatever. It cannot be. It must be your community. 
historically in in cultures, it, it was maybe the bride's family would enforce virtue upon the husband, for example. If he didn't act appropriately, his family would enforce virtue upon him. That was the idea. So there was there was safety for women within that because the community would police her husband. Well, there, historically, I would disagree because historically, you know, the old saying goes, you know, bad times make strong men, strong men make good times, Good times make weak men, weak men make bad times, right? Sure. So we're always in a constant cycle. Sure. If you choose to take the personal responsibility for starting a family, you shouldn't be doing this because your wife's family is going to beat the crap out of you if you misbehave. It's disturbing, well, right? So let's, you say, okay, go there, burn, burn the bridge, right? That's cool. If you're going to a habitable place that you can live, then you burn the bridge behind you. Excellent. If you walk onto an active volcanic island where there's no food and everything's on fire and then burn the bridge behind you, you're not being smart. So let's make sure that if people are going to enter into marriage, which again, I'm obviously in support of, we need to make it not only palatable, but excellent for both people. It needs to have a deeper purpose that allows people to flourish in personal development as, as human beings rather than holding them back to, to this extent. Yeah, let me, let me jump in and respond to some of these. So I, I actually agree with both of you, but I also disagree. So let me see if I can explain what, what I mean by that. So uh, Adam, I think you're absolutely right. In order for marriage to work, there needs to be the context around marriage to support it. But how likely is that? If you're basically making the argument that the pathway to saving marriage is to change everything else about society so that we build these new communities around them with traditional values to support this from falling apart, you could very easily make the argument that marriage is too weak and unstable in itself to be able to live, let alone thrive, in this environment. Because it's unlikely that all of this other stuff is going to change in the exact direction and intensity to support the institution of marriage. So you're not wrong, I just don't think that it's likely going to happen. By the same token, Andre's objection is actually one that I address in the book. It's, it can absolutely be true that marriage is an opportunity to self-transcend and to grow. In fact, I think that's the most enlightened response to marriage traditionally, which is basically like, as soon as you burn that bridge and you're locked into this relationship with this one person, you are going to encounter all kinds of problems. There's going to be parts of you that are going to scream to squeeze out of a keyhole to escape, right? And the most enlightened response to marriage is something like, use it. Use it as fuel for self-transcendence. Your wife isn't having sex with you anymore? Fantastic. Use this as an opportunity to, to examine your carnal attachments and get over it. Like, you don't have any time for yourself anymore because your kids are monopolizing all of your attention? Fantastic. Use this as an opportunity to examine your own residual selfishness and, and self-transcend that. Like, there is, I'm not saying that that is not true. That, that can absolutely happen. Of course, it requires a very high level of difficulty to escape the relationship in order to preserve that because people will crawl out through the mail slot if they can when and they're they do. Uh, in enough pain and dissatisfied. The, the problem with that argument, to my mind, is not that it's not true, it's that it doesn't work. Like everyone knows that exercise is good for them. Everyone knows that cardio will improve their longevity and their clarity of thinking. And how many people run marathons in their spare time because it would give them an opportunity to improve certain health metrics and to transcend certain psychological or emotional limitations? Very few people. But that's why I said that this is something that you have to decide for yourself from the onset. What type of life do you intend to live? Right? Ultimately, your human experience is something that you determine. Like there's a reason, Dr. Ryan, why you became a psychologist. There's a reason why you became a therapist, Adam, is because you guys were pursuing a particular goal and intent that you had in mind. And you set yourself up. I'm sure grad school was no fun. I'm sure you guys could have had a better time, you know, being in a boat in Maui somewhere, you know, like fishing off the coast and living a hippie life. It would have been great. But you chose not to do that because we get a lot of fulfillment from overcoming difficulty and finding ourselves by... Uh, transcending a past self by elevating and by growing. And ultimately that is the catch for many men, right? It is actually placing yourself into those shoes if you wanna do that, but nobody's making you. And I agree that eventually men will have to say, 
if I, I don't have to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't need to do that. But there is going to be a but and a cost to it because I do believe that the way society is evolving is going to be very easy to be, frankly, low value as a man. You know, there is going to be universal basic income. There is going to be a lot of things that will be so easily available. And you don't have to do. You don't have to try. You don't have to get better. You can sit on your, you know, beautiful VR goggles and you can be whoever you want. Today will be a dragon. Tomorrow you're going to be a knight. And the day after that, you'll be a wizard in some next online game. You can be your best movie star. And that's going to be the thing. Like, we're actually going to chop off the very bottom and the middle of society because they'll simply won't want to reproduce. So many people... I talk about that a lot in the book as well. Yeah. And again, I think you're absolutely right. And this argument is going to speak and enliven a minority of men. But it will absolutely not motivate the majority. And they don't want to, right? And the thing is, I actually respect that choice. I... While I do not, I deeply disagree with a child-free choice, especially for men, for women, it's a separate conversation, but I deeply disagree with that choice personally, but I respect men who can say that and say, you know what, I'm going to be a shit dad, and I just am not going to take care of another life, I'm going to drink, I'm going to be abusive, I know I'm not going to be able to handle it, just don't do it. You know what, just leave the people there who want to have that conversation, want to have that relationship. Do not go after the woman who actually want to have children and do it seriously and then lie to them and portray one thing and do another and do a bait and switch. Instead, yes, it's better to enter into a different type of relationship. If you don't intend to be monogamous, do not get married. Like that is a personal responsibility that you must have in a clarity. Right, but then leave, leave the rest of us alone. You know, don't screw the screw it up for the rest of the people who actually do want to engage. Well, in this that. is actually fully in line with with Catholic teachings as well. Is that marriage is a vocation you have to be called to, and that you will then enter into it as an expectation. It, it is it is very akin to a priesthood where you are entering into it and becoming a perpetual person in this relationship for for all of your life yeah. and and the church is very clear this is this is not a universal vocation that everyone can or should enter into it has to be very specific for this lifelong bond there there are plenty of ways to serve if you don't want to get married you don't have to go become a, a monk or a nun or a priest either there there's so many so many necessities. Yeah, but then you don't get sex either. Well, correct. Yeah. We do, <laughs> so we there's, well, there's that, a caveat. That is the way that you prevent children from being raised out of marriage because marriage is, is best for children, and that's that's what it's designed for is to foster that. But by all means, it sounds like maybe the thing that we all three agree on here is that marriage in the future is more likely to be an optional piece. It's going to follow the pathway of the person's beliefs. It's going to be probably custom out to that person's needs and, and requirements for their life. I think there's going to be additional options based on, you know, if you're Catholic, you don't get too many options of what marriage looks like. But um, maybe if, if you're not Catholic, if you have other beliefs, there will be other options. I think that there also there will be other options for people who are not married minded in this capacity at all. I, I believe, and I'm biased in this direction, but I believe that traditional marriage will out at some, will be, will be shown to be the best for society as a whole. I believe that. Sure. But, but we'll we just are, die but off first. I'm certainly not going to put a gun to anyone's head and say, go get married or else, because that, that sure. also violates it tremendously. We can't do that. And I think that actually leads us to a great place. And Dr. Ryan, we're going to come back to where we start with this. The value-based system, I think, is actually a genius system that we absolutely must consider because it gives us ranking inside our own minds, but also gives us purpose and says, what is it that I value? What is it that I value in one partner versus another partner? And that allows us to orient ourselves towards ultimately deciding what is that we want to do with our life, mm -hmm. right? It's not, deci these decisions are not just going to be who you want to be in terms of profession, but how you want to live and what you want to do and are going to become much more definitive of our identity and of our life journeys. So the value system is a great one. The attachment system is a great one. What other systems should a future, say, future-looking man implement by which they should assess themselves and find that direction? Dr. Orion. The value proposition is a tricky one. And let me spend some time on that and then I'll answer your direct question. I talk about this in chapter one of the book where each person has what I call a value algorithm that's constantly assessing people and opportunities in their environment for uh, their instrumentality in achieving personally relevant goals, okay? The issue is that that algorithm was trained on very limited data, i.e. usually the primary relationships in your family of origin so that even if you grew up with the most loving, securely attached family, 
to model as your romantic relationship ideal, it's going to be limited by the law of small numbers. It's a very small data set. And so you might end up believing that that's the only way that healthy, satisfying, loving relationships can look. It may also have a whole bunch of incorrect and irrelevant information locked into that algorithm. And the real problem is that the vast majority of this algorithm is hidden deep in the recesses of a person's unconscious. And there can even be wide disconnects between what a person thinks that they value and what they actually value as revealed by who they are attracted to and who they mate and date. Like for example, it's certainly plausible that a woman might consciously say to herself and believe it that she wants a long-term loving relationship with a stable, virtuous man. And yet that woman may find herself again and again in short-term relationships with exploitative bad boys. And she may not understand why. And the fact of the matter is that her attraction is leading her to form relationships with men irrespective of her conscious decisions. And for a while, especially if they're value algorithms were trained on, on poor data or certainly limited data, this can feel like a choice between what you're actually attracted to but may not be very good for you in terms of the success of a long-term relationship and what might actually be conducive to a long-term relationship but for whom you feel nothing for because you're not authentically attracted to that person. So we, we have to understand that values, uh, people lie and first and foremost, they lie to themselves, which is another way of saying that they deny or repress or just are unconscious about what they truly value as revealed by their behavior. And it's certainly, I mean, one of my more popular videos is the part that women always leave out. If you ask, I've asked hundreds of women in my lifetime, what do you look for in a man? And they'll say things like, oh, I'm looking for a kind man. I'm looking for um, a family focused man. I'm looking for um, a generous man. Not once in any of those informal interviews did I hear a woman say, I want a man that I'm attracted to. Because that's the part that women always leave out. They kind of, they want all of these things that they want from the men that they're attracted to. They think that that goes without saying. The problem is that men like me sometimes hear this advice and they think, oh, I don't get it. I'm a kind, generous man. Like, how come I'm having so much trouble entering into relationships and maintaining them? because women don't primarily make their determinations about who to mate and date based on those criteria. They have, like attraction comes before all of it. And then among the men that they're attracted to, they want these other qualities. And by kind of obscuring or mystifying the importance of attraction, men can be led astray in, in more than one ways than one. Okay, so that's one thing that I would um, talk about. Uh, one thing that I think has helped me a lot in having satisfying relationships in my 30s and beyond, and that which I counsel other men to consider, is rather than try to come up with your criteria set for like your ideal woman, try to think about like a criteria set for the role or the position you're trying to fill in your life. So to think about it almost like you're the CEO at a company and you're creating a position the very first thing that they do before they interview any candidates is they define the role. Like what are the expected responsibilities for this position? Uh, what do we want them to do? How do we want them to perform? And then you can reverse engineer the traits, skills, and attributes that should reasonably as be associated with the dischargement of those responsibilities. And then you can use dating as a way to covertly examine applicants or candidates for their goodness of fit with respect to that criteria set for the position. And you hire for the position. You hire for the role. And this also will enable you to consider a wider range of potential applicants. Because for better or for worse, men are so monomaniacally focused on the physical cues. This is true. Mm. This is so right? true. And so they pass up really, really good and compelling candidates for long-term relationships that way. Obviously, you want a woman in a long-term relationship that you are attracted to, like there needs to be attraction. Attraction is fuel. Like it's very clear to me that men will try harder and go greater distances for women they are attracted to than for women that they are not. And so sometimes really beautiful women motivate and inspire men to become the better versions of themselves. So attraction is not simply superficial. It redounds to a very deep level in the core of most long-term relationships, but it's not the be all and end all.
You don't just want to choose the hottest woman who will have you. Agreed. Fully agreed. Uh, a lot of young men asked me, Adam, what can I do to pick the best woman for me? And I tell them that the, the number one dating book I have ever read in my entire life is called The Co-Founder's Handbook by Tannis George. It is about how to pick a perfect co-founder for you for a business. It has nothing whatsoever to do with dating. It is entirely how to differentiate if your co-founder will ruin you financially, if they have a, a complementary skill set, which roles you will fulfill in your company, how to have difficult conversations, and it lays everything out in about 18 chapters that you need to learn to build a good functioning marriage. Nothing to do I with romance it. or sex. I often say that if it works in business, it works with women. Yes. Yeah. Business and marriage are the only two relationships, I think, on the planet that are almost identical. Everything else is so tangled up, but business and marriage, exact same skill sets. And I love that. That's awesome, guys. This was a fantastic podcast. Dr. Ryan, that was beautiful insights. I'm glad that we finally got a chance to, got, uh, to have this conversation. Now, where can people find you, and what is it that we hear about this book of yours? Oh yeah, sure. So I run a YouTube channel called Psychax. So you could find more of my short-term content there if you so desire. And I'm very proud to announce that I just recently released my first full-length book. It's called The Value of Others. The subtitle is Understanding the Economic Model of Relationships to Get and Keep More of What You Want in the Sexual Marketplace. So it's examining the behavior of both men and women in the game of mating and dating using the same set of principles. So I'm trying to create a unified field theory when it comes to sexual relationships. And I guess you can decide to what extent I've succeeded in doing so. But I'm very proud of it. Um, I think it's a, it's a phenomenal book. And I can't wait for it to have a wider distribution. Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. Adam, where can we find you? I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. You can find me on adamlanesmith.com. I'm also on YouTube as at Attachment Adam and Instagram as at Attachment Adam with long and short form video content. So you can learn to build, hopefully, long lasting, sustainable relationships through clear conversations about exactly what you're looking for. Amazing. And I'm at Andre Korokov on Instagram. You can also check out our creator work at veriduscreative.media. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Ryan, for coming on to the podcast. And this was, again, a great conversation. Adam's always nice to have. You always have such beautiful things to add. And uh, this is the part where I invite our audience to come in and comment, share, follow, subscribe. Disagree firmly in the comments. Disagree comment sections, firmly, of argue with us in every single way you possibly can, because I'm sure there's a lot of things here that you may absolutely feel strongly about. So we encourage you to please engage with us so we can respond to you. And then we'll be able to have an actual productive conversation or an unproductive conversation if you want to. That's fine too. Uh, down in the comments below. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. And we'll see you in the next episode of I Wish You Knew.